This episode of Trifles is made possible by listeners like you, who support us on Patreon and Substack. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash trifles or trifles.substack.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, Gables, Garadebs, and students all came in three packs, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? What's the difference between a gamekeeper and a gatekeeper? Between a Trigenis and a Trigallus? Between a jack-in-office and a Mr. Cocksure? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 407, That Old Black Boot. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, you 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 old black boot, you. That's me. <laughs> it's me like Chaplin. It's made of licorice and I'm eating it. Oh, it's tasty. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yum, yum, Well, yum. You're, you're broken in, you're comfy, you're, you're, you're lined. This, this is perfect. Yeah. yeah wow, I feel right at home. Well, this is going to be an interesting episode. It's one of our Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist episodes, where we look at a piece of Sherlockian scholarship from the days of yore, or perhaps the days of present. Uh, and we surface it and discuss it for those of you who might be interested in such things. Usually, they, uh, as they too, address some trifle in the Sherlockian canon. And today, I think we have a barn burner of a topic, that old black boot by George Fletcher. We'll get into exactly where that comes from and what it's all about in just a moment. Meanwhile, we wanted to remind you that you can support the show at Patreon or at Substack. You can find us at patreon.com slash trifles or trifles.substack.com, as well as at sherlockholmespodcast.com. But in either of those places, you have the option of supporting us financially for as little as a dollar a month, and it allows you to get extra content, some bonus episodes that we have, as well as some thank you gifts on Patreon, if that's the angle that you choose. Whatever you you decide to do, we appreciate you supporting the show and telling other people about what it is that you find interesting here. We love having the trifles message uh, talked about and expanded by as many Sherlockians as possible so we can all trifle together. Okay, well, we promised you uh, a theorist episode where we look at a piece of scholarship. This comes from, um, where, where does this come from, Bert? Oh, this comes from a terrific book, Papers on the Sundial, which is one of the collections of papers written and delivered at meetings of the Five Orange Pips. And it was designed and printed uh, in 2020, by Don Pollock, who's who's one of the members, and it's a collection of writings about the writings by the members of the Five Orange Pips, and it's called Papers on the Sundial. It's a beautiful book, hardcover, beautifully bound with a lovely, in lovely stamping of the symbol of the Five Orange Pips on the cover, mm. and it's a lovely collection. It is uh, the Papers on the Sundial. This is a continuation of a couple of previous publications. In 1955, the Five Orange Pips put together their, their first volume called The Best of the Pips. Uh, the, the group had been founded in 1935, um, separate from the Baker Street Irregulars. They seem to have not been aware of the BSI's early existence. And so there's been some question as to whether they're technically a scion of the Baker Street Irregulars. Um, but they they produced the first volume in 1955. And then in 1999, 
Albert Rosenblatt uh, produced a uh, Baker Street Journal Christmas annual of uh, the the Five Orange Pips uh, writing. And uh, now, of course, we have the 2020 version, uh, Papers on the Sundial. So uh, it is well worth looking at. George Fletcher, who is known as Henry Baker II in the Five Orange Pips, has a, uh, a, a an article in here called That Old Black Boot. <laughs> So uh, what's what's this uh, that that old black boot all about? Well, uh, uh, let's talk just for a moment about George Fletcher. Hmm. George is a, 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 it's hard to find words to describe George <laughs> and his his background. He is a bibliophile, extraordinarily knowledgeable. He's been a long um, serving member of the Baker Street Irregulars, but more importantly, is his career. He was. Uh, assistant editor, director of the Fordham University Press for 25 years in various jobs. Assistant editor, editor, director. And at a, part of that time, the Fordham University Press was publishing the Baker Street Journal. He was the Astor curator of printed books and bindings at the Pierpoint Morgan Library. He was the first Brooke Russell Astor director of special collections at the public library. And he was an adjunct professor at NYU and at the Pratt Institute. And in 2014, he received the Order of the Chevalier of Letters from the French government. He, and he's a member of the Grolier Club, and he's been a member of the Baker Street Irregulars, I think, since oh, about 1969. He discovered the Irregulars, I think, when he was in Germany reading an article and became connected to the Irregulars. And the old black boot. So you're dealing here with, when you deal with work written by George Fletcher, you're dealing with with work written by certainly a great writer and a great thinker about literature and about storytelling. And he starts here by um, talking about some, the whole story here about the black boot. It's a great article because it, he discovers here something that everyone until then had ignored or not seen in a major Sherlockian work, The Hound of the Baskervilles. And he says at the beginning, my annual cycle of Sherlockian reading follows a thematic scheme that's generally based upon the season and the weather. Of course, the blue carbuncle, you know, around the Christmas octave. And in August, when it's hot, the cardboard box. And that was his investiture, which Julian Wolf conferred upon him uh, in January of 1969. In autumn, the five orange pips, a bitterly, a bitterly cold and frosty morning, suggests the Abbey Grange. Autumnal fog leads me to the Bruce Partington plans. Autumnal or wintry weather means the golden pince but the dominant convergence, of course, is the greatest. The Hound of the Baskervilles, from Michaelmas to Thanksgiving, divided between the smiling, if blustery, countryside where yellow leaves carpet the lanes and bronzing ferns march along the verges, to town where a frock coat is still an ample garment. Well, and that's last year's lovely. Yeah, yeah, isn't that just absolutely lovely? It really and, is. And uh, he, he points out at that point that in the third week of November in the year 1895, a dense yellow fog settled down upon London. So that from Monday to Thursday, I doubt whether it was ever possible from our windows in Baker Street to see the loom of the opposite houses. And that, of course, is a quote from Watson. And so that's George's introduction, this beautifully written introduction, very Morley-esque introduction to this fascinating essay, The Old Black Boot. And then, of course, he gets to the point where he says, Last year's reading brought with it an eye-opener, and unless I greatly err in the discovery of an unnoted error, and this after many years of annual self-indulgence with the hound, and the matter concerns Sir Henry Baskerville's footwear. Sir Henry had his share of shoe troubles from right after he arrived in London. That's right. Now, we'll recall in Chapter 4, uh, Sir Henry Baskerville he said, I did a good deal of shopping, among other things. I brought these, I, I bought these brown boots, gave $6 for them. 
and had one stolen before I ever had them on my feet. And then in chapter five, Three Broken Threads, he said, um, Watson said, he held an old and dusty boot in one of his hands. I had only three pairs in the world, the new brown, the old black, and the patent leathers, which I am wearing. And today they have sneaked one of the black. Last night they took one of my brown ones, and today they have sneaked one of the black. So there we have the conundrum of Sir Henry Baskerville in town in London, having now had two boots stolen, one of his new brown ones and one of his used black ones. Hmm. And George says that that same afternoon meeting includes the discovery of the missing brown boot under a cabinet, mysteriously appearing where it had not only been, uh, where it had not been only shortly before. So then we go to chapter six, Baskerville Hall, and Watson asks Sir Henry, did you get your other boot? Ostensibly meaning the, the black boot that had gone missing the second day. He said, no, sir, it is gone forever. Hmm. Hmm. So bear that in mind. See, this is chapter four, chapter five, chapter six. So that's the chronology here in the case of the Hound of the Baskervilles. And that's Henry, Sir Henry's boots. So when Sir Henry, Dr. Mortimer, and Watson reach Baskerville Hall, Sir Henry, one assumes was wearing the new brown boots for travel because the patent leathers must have been in his luggage. And perhaps he had the single old black boot in forlorn hope that the Northumberland hotel manager might at some time recover the missing mate and send it to Dartmoor. Dartmoor. But anyway, the days continue to pile up. Chapter 8, the first report of Dr. Watson, October thir- it's October 13. Sir Henry had to ensure him, him here is Barrymore, that it was not so, and pacify him by giving him a considerable part of his old wardrobe, the London outfit having now all arrived. So remember here, you know, this background, because of what occurs is important, because of what happens next. On an evening, shortly after the 13th, Holmes and Watson, reunited out on the moor, come upon the dead Selden, killed in a fall. And he's identified at first as Sir Henry because of all of his attire. And, you know, Watson recalls in chapter 12, Death on the Moor, I remembered how the baronet had told me he'd handed his old wardrobe to Barrymore, who had passed it on in order to help Selden in his escape. So boots, shirt, cap, it was all Sir Henry's. It is clear, quote, it is clear that the hound has been laid on from some article of Sir Henry's. The boot, which was abstracted in the hotel in all probability, and so ran this man down. That's a quote from Holmes. And and Fletcher says there's a, there's a major difficulty here because Selden could not conceivably have been wearing Sir Henry's boots. But first we <laughs> must consider subsequent events before tackling the problem. While confirming our citations to the following. So in chapter 13, Fixing the Nets, the very next chapter, uh, they recount, the, this poor wretch was dressed in your clothes. I fear your servant who gave them to him may get into trouble with the police. Sir Henry says, well, that's unlikely. There was no mark in any of them, so far as I know. <laughs> next chapter, chapter 14, The Hound of the Baskervilles, from amid a tuft of cotton grass which bore it up out of the slime, some dark thing was projecting. Holmes sank to his waist as he stepped from the grass to seize it, and had not had we not been there to drag him out, he could never have set his foot upon firm land again. He held an old black boot in the air. Myers, Toronto, was printed on the leather inside. It was worth a mud bath, said he. Our friend Henry's, our friend Sir Henry's missing boot, thrown there by Stapleton in his flight. He retained it in his hand, using it to set the hound upon his track. He fled, knowing the game was up, still clutching it, and he hurled it away at this point of his flight. We know at least he came so far in safety. So, interesting. So, we, we've got the, the black boot, the, the worn boot that was stolen, ostensibly, uh, for its scent. Uh, 
Sir Henry said uh, there was no mark in any of his uh, clothing, so much as we, uh, so much as he knew, and yet it said Myers Toronto inside this black boot. <laughs> Curious. <laughs> Yeah, well, then in chapter 13, you know, Holmes repeats, restates what's going on here, says it was very essential for Stapleton to get some article of Sir Henry's attire so that in case he was driven to use the dog, he might always have the means of setting him upon his track. And he said about this at once, and we can't doubt that the boots or chambermaid of the hotel, boots is the boot black, uh, was well bribed to help him in his design, but the first boot which was procured for him was new and therefore useless. He then had it returned and obtained another. And Holmes says, that was most instructive. It proved conclusively to my mind we were dealing with a real hound, as no other supposition could explain the anxiety to obtain an old boot and the indifference to a new one. Well, of course, George points out the trouble, to be sure, is that Selden could not conceivably have been wearing Sir Henry's boots when he fell to his death. We may have cloaked in merciful silence any suggestion he was wearing one half the old black pair or that Sir Henry had given up the patent leathers which would have served admirably for indoor use at Baskerville Hall or the new brown pair equally admirably suited for walking abroad in the rugged countryside nor is it to be considered that he'd acquired a new black pair during the days between lunch at the Northumberland Hotel and the departure of the train from Paddington for Devonshire, and had been moved to give Barrymore either the new brown or the new black shoe. He gave away old clothes, especially the ruddy tweed suit he'd purchased while living in Canada. And then George says, well, you know, the particular trouble for me is that having personally noticed this error only after so many seasonal readings of the hound, I am hard-pressed to believe no one else has ever noticed it <laughs> or commented on it over nearly six score years since publication. Well, but I can't find anyone mentioning it, and so I leave the question's solution to other wiser heads yeah this is definitely a trifle that should have been noticed this switcheroo on the boots the new versus the old uh who was wearing what when and and george says well one explanation is that uh, it, it's a serial publication and the hound was extended over nine numbers from volumes 22 and 23 of the strand from august of 1901 all the way to April of 1902. And the chapters that he has quoted here in his extract, uh, chapter four would have uh, been issued in September, chapter five in October, and then chapters 12 in, uh, chapter 12 in February, and chapters 12, uh, 13 and 14 in March. And April would be chapter 15. So the crucial chapter 12 with its error. And remember that chapter 12 is when uh, he noted uh, the death of Selden on the moor. That would have happened in, uh, in February. And that was released a full six months after the publication began. So he said um, that that might have accounted for no one having picked up on it at the time. And, of course, one might also posit the absence of any kind of scenario before the author's eyes during the progression of the writing of this long work, an important aid to keeping established details straight. Author, indeed. <laughs> the literary agent. You know, he, he wasn't much for fact-checking, shall yeah. we say. Well, the sad part is, of course, the only one we can really ask about this is Selden. <laughs> uh, and... <laughs> And he's not responding to any of my emails. And that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. By thunder!
if that fellow can't find my old black boot. Surely it was a, a new brown boot. No. Last night, they took one of the brown ones. Today, they've sneaked one of the black. I'm sorry, Mortimer. I'm sorry to trouble you with this nonsense, but this is a first-class hotel, damn it. 